the last. There's a Gainesville native. He was the last person to graduate from the old Gainesville High School downtown. Uh, then they moved it out to 13th Street. Um, got an appointment to the Naval Academy. Graduated with about 900 people. Was one of five selected to go back and get a PhD after a year at sea. He went to Cornell, got a PhD in experimental reactor physics. Went into the Navy nuclear program, bored holes in the ocean with submarines, spent at least a whole year underwater at various times, not all at one time. Uh, retired from the Navy and spent the last 30 years before I moved here six years ago in Cypress County. So the speaker today is me. And a great guy. And Walter West. Thank, thank you. So, if we can have a slide, we'll see what happens. I think I can control them from here. Yep. Okay. This is the first of six talks on energy. And I'm going to tell you all kinds of different energy. So here we have, yesterday we were rubbing sticks together to make a fire. Today we have a little... Uh, lighter that we can make our fire with and tomorrow we may be just shooting electrons out of our fingers to do whatever we want to do so series overview today we're going to talk about all different kinds of energy and power and what is the difference between energy and power and before we get started i want to clear up a couple of terms uh electric is an adjective, so you don't hook up the electric to your house. You hook up the electricity. <laughs> and the other thing I want to say is the pronunciation of nuclear. So if you can all say after me, nuclear. <laughs> it's not nuclear. And we nuclear guys like it that way. Week two, we're going to talk energy from light, the sun and solar energy, and show you a few interesting things about solar energy at Oak Hammock. We'll talk about energy from air, the wind, current and future uses. Energy from water will be the fourth talk. Fifth talk is energy from the earth, coal, gas, oil, hydrogen, Geothermal, I'm going to have to move probably to week six because when you talk about coal and oil and natural gas and hydrogen, you've already filled up the whole thing with slides. So we'll, we'll catch it anyway. Energy from atoms, nuclear fission and fusion. And we'll then also talk about geothermal energy and about uh, energy from waste burning the garbage, and we'll talk about uh, energy uh, from the ground with steam and so forth, and add that in with nuclear. Okay, we're going to talk about environmental considerations, cost and affordability, raw materials availability, uh, shut down long-term storage requirements because that's a big issue with some of the things we'll be talking about. The site location and considerations. NIMBY is a big thing. Not in my backyard, you guys. Take that nuclear power plant and put it in somebody else's backyard. Connection to the grid. That will become a problem because right now, and we'll talk about that later, but right now the grid is kind of maxed out and it's not completely integrated across the United States. We have a grid in the Southeast, Texas has its own grid. And we saw a few years ago that uh, Texas began to freeze and Senator Ted Cruz went to Mexico. <laughs> Energy conversion and storage because that becomes a problem if you have intermittent energy being provided. Okay, definitions. Energy, the ability to do work. 
energy from can be neither created nor destroyed, only changed in form. Hence, energy within a system is constant. Work, applied force times the distance. And I'm going to use the metric system because it's ever much simpler than the English system, because then you have to deal with pounds force and pounds whatever and 12s and 44s and all of that stuff. So in, in the metric system, 10 is a good number to remember because you multiply everything by 10 up and down. And I had a good friend who said the United States is going into the metric system inch by inch. <laughs> Thermal energy is the energy to raise one gram of water, one degree Kelvin. We'll use Kelvins and centigrade instead of Fahrenheit. Makes more sense. 4.186 joules. Power is defined as the rate at which energy is being transferred. Watts and horsepower. This is the definition of horsepower. If a horse can raise 550 pounds for some strange reason, one foot in one second, that is one horsepower. And it's about 750 watts. Okay, what are some kinds of energy? Let's just have a look at all of this stuff. Mechanical energy is potential energy or kinetic energy. Thermal energy is heat. Electrical energy is volts. Chemical energy is something being burned or something being charged like your battery. Magnetic energy, we have permanent magnets on our refrigerators and we can create electromagnetic energy. Acoustic energy, just like now, I'm giving you some acoustic energy, whether you like it or not. Compression energy, and electromagnetic energy. So all types of energy from which we extract power, something is moving. If there's nothing moving, you're not getting any power. Energy itself is just sitting there waiting to be used. The rate at which it is moving determines the energy. Actually, it's the square of whatever is moving times something else, and we'll see a lot of that. We'll notice that as we examine various types of energy. We're going to do a simple way to understand potential and kinetic energy. First, you need the road runner. Then you need bird seed. You need the coyote. And you need an acne <laughs> anvil. And then you're ready to understand this stuff. Okay. You have to have a support cord and a clip. All of this works together. So here's the plan. The coyote is going to go out on a support. He's going to drop the anvil on the road runner. So carry the anvil onto the support. Drop the anvil on the road runner. Road runner burger. So here we are. He's checking on the target. He's got the anvil. He's got the board that he can go across the two cliffs with the valley down below. There is the roadrunner with his bird seed. He is the target. Now place the anvil in position. So he's going out on the board. You notice the board wasn't really strong enough. It's beginning to crack. Whoopsie. Total energy is the sum of decreasing potential energy plus increasing kinetic energy. So the Animal, the anvil and the coyote impact where the target was because the roadrunner always gets out of the way of whatever's coming at him. Kinetic energy is changed to heat and friction. The roadrunner covers up with the broken boards and he goes and has more seed. So the total energy is unchanged. The roadrunner energy increases by the amount of bird seed consumed. So let's look at something that's a little more scientific than that, but that was fun to look at. I could not find a video that would work to show all of that, so we just had to go with still pictures. Okay, potential energy is the energy that is 
an object has because of its initial condition within the system. So we have a system, an object, and something is affecting the object. So here's one, the position relative to other objects. Oopsie daisy, did I do that? Okay, there is potential energy right there. The blade is up, the person is not yet in position, but when the blade comes down, it will gain kinetic energy because it will then be moving. And you know what it does. Okay, the following examples. Okay, stresses within itself. A spring, for example, if you have a spring and you pull on it or push on it, the force is one half times the spring constant times the distance you have moved it. That stresses within itself. The electric charge, if you have a battery and a headlight and you hook it up, you have electrons moving. Q is a representation of electrons. They're negatively charged, runs around, goes through the light, and you have some energy created by the moving electrons. Chemical energy. Now, this is a great example. That's one of the best examples of chemical energy with all of that hydrogen and kerosene and oxygen on the space shuttle. And when that thing fires off, you can hear it for miles and miles and miles. And then again, therefore, energy of motion observable as the movement of an object somewhere in the system. Even subatomic particles, if they're moving around, will have kinetic energy. It's directly proportional to the mass. So it's a half times the mass times the velocity squared. And so you end up with meters, uh, kilograms. Let's see, what do we have? The mass is kilograms and the velocity is meters per second. You have kilograms, meters squared per second squared, which is joules. We'll see many examples of Ke equals something times something moving squared. Something has to move for us to extract useful energy and turn it into power. Mechanical, we have a more specific, without the road runner now, we're gonna have a rocket clip. So if we have a 10 kilogram rock and a 20 meter clip, the, the potential energy and the force of gravity is roughly 10 meters per second per second in the uh, in our system that we're using so the kinetic energy for moving is one half mv squared the potential energy is the mass times the height times the force of gravity so here we have the cliff 20 meter high kinetic energy is zero because the rock is still up there so we have 10 times 10 times 20 or 2000 joules. Halfway down, the potential energy is half of what it was on top of the cliff. And so the other part is now kinetic energy equal each 1000 joules. At the bottom, you have no more potential energy because the rock stopped and you have all of the energy is in uh, 2000 joules of kinetic energy. So the final velocity by con <laughs> conservation of energy is half times 10 times the velocity squared. Velocity squared is 400. So the final velocity is 20 meters per second, about 45 miles an hour. Halfway down, it's about 14 meters per second. It is not linear. Remember, it's one half mv squared. So, what common system has repeating potential kinetic energy? We have used them as children, and we used to have one out on the boardwalk for the residents. It was a swing. This is kinetic and potential energy, it's a pendulum. Another use of the pendulum is in a clock. And you'll notice the pendulum back and forth and the 
minute hand will click around. So I have three of these at home. This one is a grandfather clock I built many years ago from a kit with the pendulum and the weights now are providing the energy. A pendulum by itself will lose energy because of friction. So you need to add a little bit of energy. And this was a uh, carriage clock that I built. So how does the pendulum work? Let's look at it. Here is a pendulum at the top of its arc of swing. There is no kinetic energy because it's not moving. At the bottom of the arc, the kinetic energy is the maximum and the potential energy is zero because it's at the bottom of where it's falling. So the force diagram, which we're not gonna talk about, but you, if you can do these forces, the pendulum is hanging on a support and there's tension and the weight and the angle and all of this stuff. The period of the pendulum can be shown by calculation that we're not going to do. The period is two times pi times the square root of the length over the force of gravity. Now notice that the units come out right. Gravity is meters squared per second squared, or meters per second squared. The L is the length is meters. So you end up with the square root of seconds. So a two pi times the length of the pendulum square root, and you can get what it is. An escapement. Now I told you that the pendulum loses energy as it goes back and forth. So here is the escapement inside a clock. And you can see that there's a little bit of a push each time it hits the escapement. The wheel is turning in the same direction at all the times, and it's hooked up with a whole bunch of, of gears. There you can see these are some of the gears. Here, this is the spring loaded one, and the spring is wound up inside that case. But all of these gears through the escapement mechanism turn back and forth motion into clockwise rotation of the hands on a clock. This stuff in the bottom is just the shines. <clears throat> Inside the grandfather clock, there's a lot more gears and action going on. Here we have all kinds of gears. These are the chimes on each side. There's the chimes on the other clock. Thermal energy refers to the energy contained within the system because of the temperature in the system. Heat is the flow of thermal energy. So we have something moving, we can get power out of it. So a whole branch of physics is thermodynamics and deals with how the heat is being moved between different systems and how work is done in the process. Again, energy can neither be created nor destroyed within a system just change from one form to another. If you have a nuclear bomb, it's all still in the same system, depending on where you drop it, but you have a whole bunch of energy converted from the, the uh, plutonium and your ring. Okay, thermal to mechanical injury energy systems. Steam heat is one that we're all familiar with. This is a boiler in somebody's house you're making steam goes to a header where you distribute the steam into the radiator and this is a steam trap because you don't want the steam to come back you want just the condensate it goes into a pump or into a condensate receiver tank and then the pump puts it back in the boiler and it goes around and around The walking beam steam engine was one of the earlier ones that was used, and it's a very interesting machine. There's a big flywheel right in here. There's two cranks. One is hooked right to the center of the axle, and the other is hooked. The yellow one is hooked to a slide valve. You have steam coming in 
and we'll see how that works in a little while. But the yellow one pulls the slide valve up and down so it directs the steam either on top of the piston to push it down or underneath the piston to push it up. The steam turbine. This is a steam turbine. And the high pressure steam comes into this header and flows down here. These are seals to keep the steam from coming out the back end. So the steam, the high pressure starts here as the pressure is reduced or the temperature is reduced or both, the volume increases. So you have bigger and bigger blades. When it comes out the other end, it's low pressure steam, so-called, and it comes through the yellow header down to the middle of the low pressure turbine. Typically, you have it two directions so that you don't have a lot of force placed on the shaft. So it goes, again, it expands and goes out the bottom and you have very low pressure steam and there's a condenser down below. It condenses it back to water and you pump it back up again. So here's a little diagram of that. We have a pump that's pumping the water into the steam generator. Here's hot gases coming in or nuclear fission and you make steam. The steam goes out into the turbine, comes back through the condenser. You have to have some cooling water to condense the steam because in order to extract work from a system, you have to pump something and it has to get rid of something. So you can't have it just go to the turbine and be happy. Electrical energy, bolts, amps, ohms, and watts are the terms used for electrical energy. A bolt is the electromotive force, the difference of potential that would drive one ampere of current against one ohm of resistance. And this is the best that I've seen of that. You have the bolt pushing an amp and the ohm is squeezing the resistance and they're all unhappy because they're doing work. <laughs> so E, the voltage equals I, the current, times the resistance through which it flows. So E equals IR, we've all heard that. So electrical power, one watt is one joule per second equals one amp flowing through one ohm of resistance in one second. So power is equal to the current times the voltage equals watts. But we know from E equals IR that power equals I squared R. So now we have something moving, the electrons, the current squared, times the resistance through which it's flowing, and that gives the power. So here's the basic diagram. You have, you have the battery here. You have the charge going through the resistor. This is all potential energy until somebody closes the switch. Then the charges can actually move and come back to the battery. Chemical energy. Energy stored in the bonds of a chemical compound. It can be released using a chemical reaction, often in the form of heat. Those are termed exothermic. A battery is a form of chemical energy. If you are charging the battery, that's endothermic. You're putting the heat into the battery. But let's see the different kinds of heat, and we'll talk about these in the coming weeks. So petroleum photosynthesis in the presence of carbon dioxide and the green leaf in the, in the uh, chlorophyll. You take in the CO2, the light plus the chlorophyll changes it to oxygen and sugar. I'll show you that in a minute. You can have wood and biomass, and we have a biomass generator here in Gainesville. Batteries are a form of chemical energy. Cellular respiration, as the cells in your body are taking in some sugar and giving off carbon dioxide, that's a chemical energy. And then natural gas, the flames, and more. 
So the battery is a chemical. This is the kind of battery that I typically can't find when I need it. Gasoline has energy. This is potential until you light it. Same with coal. That's potential energy until you light it. Food, when you eat food, you are doing a chemical uh, exchange to take the energy out of the apple, put it into your body. Natural gas with a flame. Also, an explosive is chemical energy because when you light the dynamite, it burns extremely rapidly and instead of a controlled burn, you have an explosion. So reactions that require an input of energy to proceed may store some of that energy as chemical energy in the newly formed bonds, such as your battery. So here is the carbon dioxide on the left, plus some water in the presence of light and chlorophyll, you end up with glucose and oxygen, the respiration of the plants that give us our oxygen. Magnetic energy associated with the magnetic field. Electric currents can generate a magnetic field. That's how generators work. Magnetic energy is due to electrical charges in motion. We have permanent magnets, which is different. They have been already stored by having a wrap, a wire around a magnet, and it'll align the atom and it'll have the magnet, typically iron. So magnetic fields are generated by permanent magnets, electromagnets, and changing electric fields. So energy is stored in these magnetic materials to perform the work and is different for different materials. Magnetic energy is therefore potential energy until you use it. Scottish mathematician and scientist James Clark Maxwell with the Maxwell equations, which we all struggled with in electrical engineering. So this is a coil. Now, if you look at the current coming in and going around up the coil, this is called a clockwise coil. And if you wrap your fingers around the coil in the direction of the current, your thumb will point in the direction of the magnetic north pole of that magnetic field. So the inductive energy in the coil is caused by the current that's flowing through it. The inductance is the reluctance of the magnetic field to change if you change the current. The current is going in, and so the inductive energy is a half L, the inductance I squared. Again, the old something moving squared times something not moving. Okay, magnetic energy, some of the uses in a generators. Uh, we have those giant generators that I hear every Wednesday morning from the outback when it goes on. And they are, what, 500 megawatts? They're, they're big generators. They make a lot. Of the maglev, that's magnetic levitation. If you have a magnetic field on the train that's opposite of the magnetic field on the track, it can reduce the friction. It can lift the train partly so that it will have less friction while going down the road. Loudspeakers got a coil in it with some uh, fabric that vibrates back and forth. Headphones, the same thing, something is vibrating. Refrigerator magnets are, are uh, permanent magnets, typically shown in a horseshoe with the North Pole and the South Pole. <laughs> Acoustic energy is kinetic energy. And here is the spectrum for uh, acoustic energy. Infrasonics, elephants use that below our hearing range of about 20 hertz when you're young. And you can hear about 20 kilohertz. Hertz is a one cycle per second. So this is all the acoustic energy because it's in our range of hearing. Above that range, you have ultrasonics, 
So the bats and some other things are using the ultrasonic to communicate. As you get higher in frequency, you can have medical and destructive ultrasonics. There is a procedure whose name I have forgotten of exploding a kidney stone by using ultrasonics, and it's in this area. If you get the uh, acoustic frequency to match the resonant frequency of the kidney stone, it gets all excited and blows apart, and hopefully it won't be as painful. I've never had to do that, fortunately. Okay, diagnostic and non-destructive evaluation of ultrasonics. Do you have a boy or a girl? What else is going on in your body that we need to look at in this frequency? And it goes on up to very, very high frequency. So these are the frequencies for acoustic energy. Again, something is moving. The air is vibrating back and forth, or the ultrasonic device is vibrating back and forth and putting that energy into your body and looking at you. So potential energy, when I stop talking, that's potential energy. If I start talking, that's kinetic energy because I'm moving particles of air around that hit your ear hopefully, so you can hear me talk. Directed energy, a singer shatters the wine glass. We remember those ads on TV 40, 50, 60 years ago. So she is singing a high note at the frequency, the resonant frequency of that wine glass. And if she sings it loud enough and long enough and the resonant energy is enough to cause the thing to vibrate, it will it will disintegrate. Some people wonder if that isn't part of the Havana syndrome. The uh, directed low energy acoustics may be going in and messing up people's brains. I've, I've heard also that it could be uh, electromagnetic energy. Who knows? Compressed fluid energy. This one is an interesting one. You have a compressor or a hydraulic pump, air is a fluid. So here we have an air compressor, similar to the one my son has in his garage. You have the compressor up here, which is taking atmospheric pressure with a piston like a car engine, except it is just compressing the air and storing it in the tank. And then you have a, a, a hose to pump up your tires or whatever you need to do. So that is pressure times the volume divided by the temperature is a constant. If you increase the pressure, you have to decrease the volume or increase the temperature to balance this equation because it must remain a constant. Okay, here's a hydraulic energy. So we have a reservoir of oil. We have a motor driven pump. We have a hand pump with one way check valve. So the, the motor sends the high pressure into the red lines. This is a relief valve, so you won't blow anything up. This is a rotary valve. In this case, we are sending the high pressure to this side of the ram, the actuating cylinder is going to the left, rotate the valve, and the cylinder puts the high pressure here, pushes the valve that way. So we have these in the summary. If we had a reservoir of hydraulic oil, we had hydraulic pumps, pipes all around, we use that to operate the rudder or the diving planes. And if the pump gave out, you put a sailor on the hand pump and he got a, a good sweat. <laughs> but you could do it in manual. And these valves, the valve here, would be at the rudder control station or where the uh, hand planes, the uh, diving planes are operated. And that's what kept us hopefully 
surfaces to equal values. That's a good equation. Okay, potential energy is stored in the fluid and it's pressure. Kinetic energy is when the fluid is moving. So here, here we can see hydraulic rams that operate the shovel. So here is a hydraulic ram that can go both ways. It can raise and lower this thing by hinging it right here. There are other hydraulic rams that can raise and lower the whole mechanism. And there's a hydraulic ram here that will operate the shovel itself. And probably the uh, drive for this may be hydraulic or it may be uh, run off of the diesel engine electrically. This one is very interesting. I did not know this. What does it look like? Looks like the steam locomotive, but they use it in the mines and you don't want to have an energy source burning coal or anything else, making the hot steam in the mine because it's called explosions. But this works just like a regular steam locomotive, but this whole tank is compressed air and it goes in and out of the mine. Electromagnetic energy. I'm going to show you the spectrum. It goes actually lower than this, but broadcast radio and television and further down was a very, very low frequency uh, radiation that we used for the submarines communication while we were underwater. We had a floating wire antenna that we dragged behind. It was about 2,000 feet long. And it floated from the back of the sail up to the surface of the ocean. And if the officer, the deck, and the captain weren't having an argument about which way to throw the rudder, we wouldn't cut the wire. Uh, the captain and I were, we were testing out our hovering system in the Mediterranean in a very rough sea. And we popped up to the surface, and the trailing wire was trailing back after this, that's also where the rudder and the screw is for propelling the ship. I said, right full rudder, and the captain said, left full rudder, and between us, we cut that wire. So at one time, I had about foot and a half or two feet of floating wire that the, elect the radioman cut off of the residue, put it on a plot and gave it to me. Without the help of Lieutenant Commander Wynn, this would not have been possible. So I don't know where that went, but they, they were unhappy. They had to reel in what was left and put out another 2,000 feet of floating wire in it. Down. So that's very, very low frequency off the board here somewhere. Our microwaves are electromagnetic energy. They are around two to four megahertz at the frequency that water vibrates. And that's why you can cook. That's why if you put something dry in the microwave, nothing's going to happen. Or if you turn on the microwave without some water in there to absorb the energy, you can get sparks and it's not a good idea. Infrared we know about. We get infrared heaters. Here's the visible light. That's what makes things visible for us to see. And you can remember the color because it's Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, and violet, the higher and higher frequency. Ultraviolet is above violet. It's absorbed by the skin to give you a nice suntan or sunburn. Much higher frequency is x-rays to look inside our bodies and see what's going wrong. Even higher energy is gamma rays, used in medicine for killing cancer cells. Some of us here have had uh, gamma ray treatment and high energy photon treatment to kill cancer cells. And I'm glad to say that mine worked because my PSA has been zero since 2000 when I was treated. So though that's the electromagnetic spectrum. We have an electromagnetic magnetic field. And this is a traveling wave. 
photons and electromagnetic uh, wave is flowing to the right. So the wave is traveling this way. The electric field, in this case, is shown vertical, and the magnetic field is shown horizontal, and they vibrate back and forth. So the wavelength is from one peak to the next peak, and it's measured in hertz, megahertz, kilohertz, terahertz, ouch. Okay, the energy is Planck's constant times the frequency. So Planck's constant's got all of the, the uh, feet and well, meters and everything else to make it come out right to get joules out of K times F the frequency. Solar energy, it, the, the sun is really the source of almost all of our energy everywhere. Photosynthesis created the ferns and the plants, which fell to the bottom of the swamp and became coal. So here we see the beginning of coal. It's peat in the peat bogs in uh, northeastern England. And as the pressure increases and more things fall on top, it goes into lignite, more pressure, more heat, subbituminous, then bituminous soft coal and anthracite is the hard coat. So that's all because of the sun was shining and you had plants and animals that died and fell to the bottom. Ferns and plants and animals like dinosaurs became petroleum. Petra is rock, oleum is oil. So here you have the water dead and decaying, decaying organic matter piling on top of itself and Going on and on, you have sedimentary rock, you have the trapped fossils, and then you have an impermeable, impermeable rock that's holding the whole thing together down below. You have oil and natural gas in pockets. We'll talk about that in uh, week five. Solar energy heats the atmosphere, creating the wind. It heats the water bodies, the water cycle, water wheels, hydroelectric dam. So here we go. This is the sun doing everything for us. It's heating the water. You'll have some evaporation from the ocean. You'll have some precipitation on the ocean. You'll have condensate in the clouds, which move over the land because typically the land is hotter than the ocean. So we get ocean breezes. Sometimes on the radio, radar, you can see exactly that in Florida, where you'll have the Gulf breezes coming in, crashing into the Atlantic breezes, and huge thunderstorm running the whole length of the state. So we have a lake with evaporation, but we have some rain over the land. We have rain and snow on top of the mountains. So you have some surface runoff into the lakes. You have some infiltration into the ground, and so you have groundwater flow. Water likes to seek its level, so it's flowing downhill and out into the ocean. But you have the lake, and in this case, our lake has a dam on it. So this is the sun. So the sun made the coal, and it made the uh, lignite, and it made the petroleum. And We'll see later in one of the, uh, probably next week, we'll see how the sun is also making various uh, chemicals and atoms. And when they are aggregated to form the earth, way down deep in the earth with the heavier things like uranium. And it has come from a solar explosion from a giant red star billions of years ago. And it's funny, we use years and seconds they have no physical meaning except how we define them. A year means nothing in space because we define the year as one pass around the sun for the earth. And the seconds and the hours are also arbitrary units. Geothermal energy, the heated rocks down below the, where the magma comes closer to the surface, 
and particularly where you have um, the plates, tectonic plates running against each other, you have sources of thermal energy all around. The, the whole Pacific has, is the rim of, rim of fire from the plates that are coming ashore or going out, out to sea, North America, South America, Europe, and so forth. Um, sometimes you have steam vents. I think I took this picture in Iceland. Iceland gets a huge percentage of its energy from geothermal energy. And we'll talk about that uh, toward the end of the uh, series. But they have pipes of hot water. And I have a picture of the pipes before they pave the road or the sidewalk. And they melt the snow and the ice using thermal energy. Every house has hot water from the thermal wells. Um, and then they have these steam vents and below ground, they have very high temperature, high pressure water confined by the rocks. And if you drill a well down in there, you can run your turbine off of that. We'll talk about that later. Heat pumps are an energy source. We use heat pumps all the time here in Florida. If you uh, were back at your house, you more likely have a heat pump for your air conditioner. And it also heated the house during the winter. And there was electrical emergency heating because sometimes it's too cold for the heat pump to really extract heat from the cold air. And we had a friend who uh, lived in Citrus County with us. Uh, he didn't know about the emergency heat. And he and his wife both caught pretty bad cold because they couldn't heat their house. So here's how this thing works. The heat pump is exactly what it says. It's pumping heat from where you don't want it to where you do want it. So in the winter time, we're transferring heat from a loop in the ground, come back up to the heat exchanger and the pump and the warm air into the house. In the summertime, we reverse the flow and you take the heat out of the house, leave it underground, take some cool water and you cool off the system. And it's very efficient because the water in Florida, me, <laughs> the water in Florida is about 72 degrees on the ground. So it's very easy to heat your house by extracting some water from 72 degree, uh, some heat from 72 degree water than it is to try to extract some heat from the 40 degree air. And operating the other way, you can extract the cool from the 72 degree and put it in the house. I always thought I would live next to one of the streams in Florida and just pump 72 degree water into the house for my cooling. I never got that far in my projects. But the heat pump is more efficient than a, an air conditioner all by itself because it takes some of its heat or exhausts some of its heat into the ground or the air. Nuclear energy, radioactive decay. There are some naturally or unnaturally created radioactive elements and they throw off radioactive particles like uh, neutrons, electrons, alpha particles, those are moving. Remember, moving particles create energy. So the radioactive decay is combined in a cylindrical device here. And wrapped around it are thermoelectric coils that generate electricity from heat. That's the way a thermal couple worked. I remember in the double E class at Cornell, we had to weld our own thermocouples and then use them to detect the temperature of things. And so if you have two dissimilar metals welded together, on one side, you'll get electrons out. On the other side, you'll have electrons accepted. So this is working. But again, I had mentioned earlier, 
that you can't just have the heat. The heat has to go somewhere and go through something. And as it goes through something, it creates some power. So we have the thermocouples wrapped around and these fins are where the, uh, this one was used on the moon. Um, the fins uh, allow the excess heat to be taken away so that the thermocouples will actually create electricity. You can take the electricity and run devices. There are some radioactive thermoelectric generators that are on Voyager 1 and 2. I don't remember when they were launched. It was sometime in the 70s, possibly. They're still generating electricity. One of the Voyagers is beyond the Earth's and the universe, beyond the... Beyond the Mars orbit. Oh, they're way beyond Mars. It's, it went past uh, Pluto, which is no longer a planet, for Pluto. Uh, and it's way, way out, billions of miles away, and they are still receiving signals from it because the thermoelectric generator is still working. They're now, because the thing is like, I think it takes something like a week to get the signal back and forth. And so you can't adjust how it's pointed very, very well. And they've had some problems with that now. So they're not, they may not get signals much longer, but they've been getting signals for years and years. And it came from the thermoelectric generator. The other thing, or another thing is fission. Fission means to break something up. We're going to break up a target nucleus, and we'll talk about this a lot in the last week. You have an, a neutron that hits a target nucleus like uranium-235. That gives it enough energy to cause it to vibrate rapidly and blow apart. And you get these fission products. I'm playing the laser in there. The fission products they are not symmetrical. It doesn't come in half. So you have some of the uh, fission particles are less than half as big as the U-235. Others are larger than half as big. But you also get two and a half more neutrons out of the process. So you can create a chain reaction if you do it right. If you do it wrong, you get a bomb. If you do it right, you get a uh, submarine nuclear power plant. <laughs> so here is the Crystal River nuclear power plant. It's that little dome there. These are cooling towers for the steam generators they had uh, four coal-fired <clears throat> steam generators at uh, Crystal River Energy Complex. The smokestacks are here. And you can see here an incline, and that incline is taking the coal up into this steam generator. I had a tour of the nuclear power plant at uh, Crystal River and of the steam plants, and I went into one of the cooling towers, and the other cooling for the two of the first steam generators is from the channel from the Gulf, the water from the Gulf, to cool off two of the generators and the nuclear power plant. The nuclear power plant no longer operates because Duke Energy thought they were smarter than hiring some professionals to replace the steam generator. And when they cut the hole in the side of the concrete, which is about three feet thick. When they put it all back together again, they could no longer tension it properly to contain the nuclear power plant. So they have a beautiful new steam generator with no steam. Mm -hmm. um, and the Duke Energy rate payers are paying for that mistake, not the corporate. It doesn't come out of their dividends, doesn't affect the CEO's salary. The rate payers take all the loss there. Okay, we have fusion. Fusion is putting something together. 
Here we're going to take deuterium, which is hydrogen with one extra neutron, and tritium, which is hydrogen with two extra neutrons, and we're going to slam them together, and it'll make helium over here, and it'll give off neutrons, but it won't give off other damaging radiation, and you get energy out, and you get way more energy out from fusion than you do from fission. That's why the hydrogen bomb is so much more powerful than the fission bomb. But it is not easy to do. In order to do that, you need to confine the deuterium and the tritium, which you can't just go to the store and buy. And you have to keep them at a temperature of several million degrees. And at that point, it doesn't matter whether it's Fahrenheit or Kelvin. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hot. You have to get them to the, the temperature inside the sun. And you have to contain it. And we're going to look at, at how that is done. This is one of the fusion reactors that they're working with. They have had some uh, success. Success is, is defined as you can get a millisecond or microsecond or femtosecond more energy out than you put in. But how big is this? There's a guy, two guys down there talking. There's a guy up here with a red shirt. This thing must be about 50 feet high. And you have to have temperatures inside of the fusion gases that are like a couple million degrees or so, but they have to have them rotating around with a very high energy, very low temperature magnet. So now in the outside here, we're going to be at like zero degrees Kelvin. In the inside, you're going to be at a few million degrees and you have to have a huge cooling system and a huge electrical system to run the magnets that cause the pot to be stirred. Uh, I'm not very optimistic about this kind of fusion. There is another kind of fusion where you take a capsule which contains tritium and deuterium, and then you have about several hundred lasers that simultaneously zap this thing and cause it to fuse and get some helium. They've had some success with that. Uh, all of that is still in the development stages and it's years and years from actually working. So in summary, here's the kinds of energy we looked at today. Oh, good, we're almost done. Um, we have the forms of energy, nuclear, nuclear fission inside the Earth's core, inside the sun, we have nuclear fusion, the food that people eat striking a match is chemical, electrical is the power lines and the lightning that we see, radio waves is electromagnetic, infrared, visible light, thermal energy, melting your ice cream, and heating your soup. Mechanical energy, a leaping frog, and a moving car. The lurking problem is the electrical grid. The grid current capacity is adequate for what we're doing now. But if you start putting all these solar panels and everything else around wind power all over the place, you need a way to hook it to the electric grid. And the electric grid, grid has to be robust enough. The grid runs at tens to hundreds of thousands of volts for reasons we'll talk about at some point, maybe. Uh, it requires local power substations that provide the proper voltage. You, at the generating station, you have to step the voltage up. If they're useful place, you have to step the voltage down. We typically operate on uh, 110 volts in our stuff in the house or 220 through the dryer. Uh, by the way, I think uh, my dryer is probably working on about 12 or 13 volts. It doesn't dry things very well. The grid power substations require local and remote control. This is the grid. 
somewhere out back of the uh, uh, Missy and, and Harvey's house, there are some of these things. I don't think they're this big, but these can be running at 750,000 volts. And I was at the uh, energy complex in Crystal River one time. We were up, there was a bird watch. We went where some of the power lines were, and you could hear them sparking because it was a foggy day. So you can lose energy through the grid. So here we have a generating station, the step up transformer here, the transmission lines at hundreds of thousands of volts, substations step down, and then you have to have some local step down. And we have some, if you look around at the great big green boxes on the road here, those are step down generators, are um, transformers that put the power at uh, 120, 240 at our house. So this is the grid. So in 2020, you can see not very well, but the thickness of the line indicates the power that those lines can carry. And look at from Miami up to Tampa, there's a very big wide one because they have a couple of nuclear power plants down in the uh, Miami area. I think they're still operating, but they have thinner lines. And out here in the Midwest, they have very, very thin lines. And later we're gonna see that Texas cards itself out but by 2030, this is what we need with a lot more transmission capability through the grid all around the country. And if you look in this area, you can't see it very well. Wind power is in blue. Where are the wind power generators typically in the Great Plains where the wind is? Where are the people that need the power? They're not there. So you've got to ship it somewhere else. We're having now, there's some. Just off of the Cape Cod, they brought online the wind turbine and it's doing 10 or 20 megawatts. They're putting more off of Long Island. New Jersey has canceled their big one because of political pressure and some misinformation. Solar power, there'll be some down here in Florida, some all around the place. People say you can't have solar power because it gets cold. That's what saved Texas's butt when they had that big freeze when, when Senator Cruz went to Acapulco. They had solar panels working. It was so cold, it froze the operating system in some of the natural gas power plants, which really led to their problem. Texas has a law that you must favor thermal energy from the ground, oil, natural gas. They don't have any tools, Texas or anything. But that led to their problem. So here's a look at by side by side what they need and whether we'll get there. There's a lot of money been put into the infrastructure and the grid and the one of the two packages passed in Congress in the last year or two. Comparative cost of energy, we're just going to look at. Just notice the trend that as we as we get larger capacity, the price is going down. And this is the solar photovoltaic cell. The price has gone from like four hundred dollars per megawatt hour down to somewhere in the 60, 70s. Coal hasn't changed much because the technology is the same as it always was. Natural gas would fit in the same as coal because they're converting a lot of the coal power plants to natural gas because it's cleaner. This is the electric Detroit Model D, 100 mile range, 25 miles an hour until gasoline came out. Next week, solar energy. I'm going to tell you what's in the sun, how it got there, what it does for us, and we'll talk with some of John Paul's statistics about what. The panels on our roof are doing to cut the price of the low panel. So are there any questions? I don't see any questions. I must be good. Oh, here's one. <laughs>
Oh, on your stress. If I'm lying in bed in the morning and my wife wants me to get out of bed, then I tell her I'm conserving my potential energy. You are, indeed. Uh, she will not believe it. <laughs> <laughs> She'll think you're just being lazy, like the real thing. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, I would like to begin to uh, discuss briefly um, burning uh, cellulose. Uh, as a uh, economical and pollution lowering resource. There was a lot of discussion about that over the years. And I remember my high school friend and Naval Academy classmate, Dick Dickinson, wrote a lot of letters about that when it was about to come online. I don't know how that that is really solving the CO2 equation because you're burning wood and you're making CO2. But there's some discussion that if you leave the wood lying on the ground, it's going to rot and the CO2 will escape anyway. Um, I'll talk about biomass in the last discussion. Um, that's a, an albatross around the neck of GRU in the city of Gainesville. It was a bad idea to start with, and it's the worst idea now, and we owe millions of dollars because we were going to pay even millions more if we didn't buy it. So uh, they, oper they operate pretty well. Yeah. They paid way too much money for it. Oh, yeah. And they, they are probably about as efficient as a coal plant. They may get near that temperature. For a, for a steam plant, you're looking for very high pressure steam, 1,000, 2,000 PSI, because remember the heat is the energy and the higher the heat, the higher the temperature, the higher the pressure, the more efficient the system will be. So nuclear power plants on ships are not terribly efficient. When I went through the Crystal River plant, I saw their main feed water pump, which was a 30,000 horsepower pump. The submarines that I was on had 15,000 shaft horsepower. So they had a, a water pump over there bigger than what I had in the submarine. And now, uh, hang up now. Here, you can do the math. I went to my 50th reunion and I got this for the Naval Academy. I graduated in 59. Can you show it this way for the thing? And you can figure out how old I am. <laughs> old is certain. <laughs> Are there any questions on Zoom? Don't see any hands. I followed along as a fourth grade teacher for a little while. <laughs> well, I, I will try to keep them down to about an hour, maybe a little less. Uh, I'm going to have to change number five because trying to do coal, coal, oil, natural gas, hydrogen, geothermal, biomass, and waste of energy is too much. <laughs> it's just way too long. So hopefully I'll have a few more jokes. Today's ending joke I saw on Facebook. The teacher asked the class, name the title of a book that made you cry. And little kid in back said, Algebra. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Walter. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Are we going to be open next week? We should be.